he made us a promise that the gates of hell would never prevail against our most holy Catholic Church. These are Catholics that are working within the church and they feel like the church has abandoned them. If a child is being uh, abused by somebody in the church, get that person out. They're scared. They know that we have stuff and we're working and we're going to expose it. The rapist comes through the window with a ski mask. The priest comes through the front door with a collar. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Hummel. Instead of waiting on the Diocese of Lafayette to release the list of accused priests it first acknowledged 15 years ago, KETC has published our own list. Quite simply, we think the public has a right to know. You know some of their names, like Gilbert Gothay, the first priest in the country convicted in the clergy sex abuse crisis, but there are others you may not know. In 2014, KETC started by putting together a list of priests who have been accused of sexual abuse. Our reporters and producers then scoured thousands of pages of documents, all public records, to find support for these accusations. To make our list, the person had to meet one of four requirements. The diocese has settled a lawsuit against them. A religious group announced they faced credible accusations. They were arrested or publicly announced by law enforcement as being under investigation, or they have pending criminal or civil suits on file. The majority have never been convicted. Their cases often handled internally by the church and never referred to law enforcement. Often a settlement was reached and the victims would not go to police. That means many of the priests never had a chance to defend themselves and their accusers never had an opportunity for justice in a court of law. Right now on KETC.com slash the list, you can read the background on each priest and we'll have more opportunities to look at the list coming up. But first, Lafayette was ground zero for the church sex abuse scandal in the 1980s, and now, all these years later, the scandal continues. We hope to gain credibility with our people. We hope to gain their trust that the church is moving forward, that we're dealing with it in a forthright manner, and admitting our faults and mistakes and that we're striving to do all that we can to protect children in the future. In 2004, then Bishop Michael Jarrell first acknowledged a list of 15 who faced credible accusations of sexual abuse involving children. KTC uncovered a list of at least 36 clergy. Jarrell would later say he saw no purpose in releasing their names. Through our investigation, we found similar stories of priests abusing children, telling them it was God's will, and the shameful cover-up by church leaders who moved abusive priests who would go on to pray again on children. There's Mark Broussard. He was convicted in Calcasieu Parish, but has accusations against him in Cameron and St. Landry parishes. We've uncovered a new document where Broussard tells church officials he tried to tell the bishop in Calcasieu about what he had done in 1988, but when he started telling the bishop, he says the bishop put him under the seal of confession. What members of clergy hear in confession is kept confidential. Broussard is now serving time at Angola. 
Then there is retired priest Gerard Smith. We obtained his personnel file. Smith was accused of sexual abuse in Calcasieu, Lafayette, and St. Landry parishes. A church memo indicates he fathered two children in Kankton. You know, no one believed us because the priests were almighty, the bishops were almighty, the cardinals knew about it. One of his accusers, Roy Touche, a former altar boy at St. Anne's in Youngsville. Touche complained about Smith at least three times. Uh, they just didn't want to do anything. All they did was cover him up, going, you know, they were shielding him and moving him from state to state to different dioceses. And, you know, it was just like an organized crime. KTC investigates uncovered the church knew about the allegations against Smith as early as 1982. In 2010, a diocesan review board under Bishop Jarrell found at least one of the allegations had, quote, a semblance of truth. There is no indication the diocese ever reported the allegations to police. State police only got involved in 2015 when Touche filed a criminal complaint. State police found the evidence was credible, but old laws prevented prosecution. In the 60s, the statute was very clear that aggravated rape was the, the rape of a female. The, the same conduct with a, a male was not, yes, it's unfortunate, uh, but I'm duty bound to follow the law. They need to come out there and let the public know who these priests are, who the pedophiles are, so the public can have their own opinion of what they need to do. When I was abused at 12, I froze. Now I am able to fight back. The boy in that photo is Tim Lennon, a clergy sex abuse survivor himself. Lennon grew up to become the president of the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests, or SNAP. On behalf of fellow survivors, he's called on the church to release the names of accused priests. An overwhelming number of victims of child sex abuse never come forward. So when you have a disclosure such as uh, you did, this provides an opportunity, maybe for the first time, for survivors to see that they're not alone. Lennon is also pressing the state to take action against the church. The problem is they control the information. And without a statewide independent investigation, without subpoena power and compelling testimony under oath, it's the bishops to decide what kind of information is presented. In a statement, Attorney General Jeff Landry said, the law of the state of Louisiana does not give me, as Attorney General, the authority to take a prosecution from a district attorney without their request or to launch a statewide prosecution against a person or group. Well, my reaction is, is to be creative. In other words, in some states, we know that uh, there can't be a grand jury like Pennsylvania, but we can do something like New York, where there's a partnership between the local district attorneys and the attorney general of the state. Despite knowledge of the list, as far as we know, no law enforcement agency nor district attorney has pressed the diocese to release their names. A list of 15, are you requesting that list from the diocese? No, I've not requested it. Again, like I said, I, until I have a victim with a, with a complaint, I'm not sure what purpose it serves them. Because there's this list of 15. That the church determined. Right. In their own deal. And they but have shouldn't a they be investigated? Well they, well, they did their investigation. This day, they could be living near schools. They could be living near playgrounds. Do you think it's in the public interest for those 15 names to at least be released? Well, again, whether they, that was done or not, is the question is they've not been convicted criminally. Your burdens of proof may be different. I mean, I, I don't know that the, the church in their, in their investigations are required to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. We are. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Scott Payton is a deacon in the Diocese of Lafayette, but first and foremost, he's a father. For years, he celebrated Mass with Father Michael Guidry, the man now accused of molesting his son. And, and that's the difficult part because uh, Guidry hid behind the, the, the Roman collar. 
He used that to hide behind to gain our trust, uh, to gain the trust of our son, and then he abused that trust and he manipulated uh, our son and he manipulated our family uh, to violate our son uh, in, in a most horrible way. Deputies say Guidry confessed, but he's now submitted a written plea of not guilty. As Catholics, we have put a lot of trust in the men who are running the institutional church, and those men have betrayed our trust. The day of Guidry's arraignment, Deacon Peyton prayed a rosary, joined by his wife, friends, family, and fellow clergy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy They prayed for all earth. affected by clergy sex abuse. By doing this, not only are we helping our son to heal, but for all the other victims who can't, who can't do this on their own, and now can see that there are people praying for them um, because they can't do it alone. This is just much too difficult. My faith is strong. Uh, I believe in the Catholic faith that was given to us by Jesus. The focus, in my opinion, has not been on Christ. Uh, when the focus is on Christ, um, you follow the truth um, and you can't go wrong with the truth. Father Guidry is one of three priests removed from ministry over sexual abuse allegations in 2018. Reverend Jody Simino was placed on leave over allegations of improper behavior with minors more than 30 years ago. The allegations from when Simino was assigned to St. Anthony's Church and St. Edmund High School in Eunice and St. Anne's Church in Youngsville. On September the 18th, 2018, about three weeks ago, I was informed of an accusation of sexual abuse of a minor by Monsignor Roby Robichaud. Monsignor Roby Robichaud. He's facing decades old allegations of sexual misconduct by at least two women. I wanted to know the truth about what occurred or did not occur. But the initial accuser went to the diocese in both 1994 and 2004. Despite her accusations, Robichaud was allowed to stay in ministry, work in schools, and was even promoted within the diocese to the post of judicial vicar. So many times people will come to me in confession and say, Father, I still feel angry. I, I still feel the hurt. I, I still feel the disappointment in being hurt by so-and-so. When Bishop Gerald learned of the accusation, he consulted with the Holy Office in Rome, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. The initial accuser was 16 when the alleged abuse happened Canon law would have considered her to be an adult, civil law a minor. Bishop Gerald sided with the church. I am deeply sorry that this has happened to any child of God who has been abused by a priest. Three months after that news conference, the diocese finally reported Robichaud to New Iberia police, saying it was at the victim's request. But police may not be able to build a case the statutes of limitations were much lower at the time of the alleged crimes. Well, there, there's two issues. There's, there's um, really three issues. There's the civil lawsuits, there's criminal prosecutions, and then there's the church rules, right? And what we want is those three arenas to work together to minimize the risk to children. So Ken Levy is a law professor at LSU. We asked him what happens when the church becomes aware of old complaints by law, members of clergy are mandatory reporters. It's very fact specific. Um, when the clergy is made aware of ongoing abuse, if the abuse is already passed, um, the, the way the laws are written is there's really no legal obligation to report that. So although members of clergy are mandated reporters, he says those state laws are limited to current and ongoing abuse. The, where the tweaking really need, where the legislatures really need to think hard about revising uh, is with the mandatory reporting. The state has to be the one to deal with this. Um, it can't be up to the church. And right now, the laws are written in such a way that they still give too much deference to the church. Whether a violation of church policy or state law did or did not occur, there is a woman who reported an allegation of sexual abuse against a priest and nothing was done for 14 years. KTC spoke with Robichaud's initial accuser. She says in 1994 and in 2004, both Bishop Flynn and Bishop Gerald 
were presented with the same information. She questions why more wasn't done before now. With faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and with love of God in my heart, I do accept the pastoral care of the people of God in the Diocese of Lafayette. Bishop Gerald was installed as the sixth bishop in the Diocese of Lafayette in December 2002 as the church sex abuse crisis was unfolding nationwide. Gilbert Gothe molested an awful lot of kids. I, I know he'll do it again. I, I could probably guarantee he'll do it within a month. Already a familiar scandal in Lafayette, the diocese promised reform. The church is moving forward, that we're dealing with it in a forthright manner. But under Gerald's leadership, there are now questions if that promise was kept. The answer is for them. Bishop Desitel, do you agree with Bishop, Bishop Desitel, thank you. Decision? As we said, we will not be taking questions, and this ends our statement. Thank you for being logistical, here. A logistical thing. On September 18th, he had said that there weren't anyone. No more questions, Jim? I'm sorry. That news conference was 15 weeks ago, raising new questions about openness and transparency in the Diocese of Lafayette. It is my duty and my distinct pleasure to welcome especially His Excellency, the Most Reverend Douglas Desitel, our new shepherd. We are blessed indeed. Since his installation in 2016, Bishop J. Douglas Desitel has had to address four cases of clergy sex abuse. In 2016, when child pornography charges came out against Father David Broussard, Bishop Desitel held a news conference and took questions. As soon as we knew something happened, we wanted the word to get out to the priest of our diocese and also to the media, to you guys. Same in June 2018, announcing accusations against Father Michael Gidry. At this time, I'm glad to entertain any questions that anyone uh, might have for me. But in October, acknowledging accusations against Monsignor Roby Robichaux, Bishop Desitel refused to take questions. As we said, we will not be taking questions, and this ends our statement. Thank you for being logistical, here. Well, logistical thing. On September 18th, he had said that there weren't anyone. No more questions, Jim? I'm sorry. The media was instead asked to submit questions through email, and we did. Was Bishop Gerald's handling of the case appropriate? Is there any accountability? Does Bishop Gerald have a statement? Fifteen weeks have passed since those questions were submitted. Still, no answers from the diocese. In November, accusations against Reverend Jody Simino were announced in an emailed statement. No news conference, no opportunity to ask questions. Is that openness? Is that transparency? No, of course not. And again, the reason he does any kind of announcement or transparency is because he's compelled to do. KATC has learned at least one other person has now come forward with allegations of sexual abuse against Simino. The man says he was inappropriately touched by Simino starting when he was around 11 years old. While Simino was training to be a priest, he says it continued after Simino was ordained. He writes, being from a Catholic family, priests were holy superstars. The attention made him feel special and honored. He came forward one day after seeing Simino was placed on leave. The diocese praised his courage and bravery. He says they offered to pay for counseling, but he hasn't heard back. At the accuser's request, the complaint was forwarded to police. The case closed because of the statute of limitations. But the new complaint was never disclosed by the diocese, a break in previous policy. For example, when a new allegation surfaced against Monsignor Robichaux, the public was notified. The church in general has to expose it, address it, and deal with it, or else that's the scandal. It's going to continue, and that's what leads people away from the church, because they see the cover. Transparency and openness, so concerning for some Catholics, they formed an anonymous group. The Society of St. Peter Damien, active online, vowing to expose institutionalized corruption in the diocese, one of its members now coming forward. Quinn Abair is a former seminarian in the diocese. Really, clergy not stepping up and doing their duty. St. Peter Damien, our patron, uh, was very outspoken. He was a priest and very outspoken. We don't see that amongst the clergy because it is not our place, really, to be doing this. And yet, we've been forced to because those whose place it is refuse to act. Is this institutionalized corruption? Absolutely. How so? It, it goes from the very bottom to the very top. And there's a camaraderie, and I, I, you know, there's a camaraderie amongst priests, and it's, it's beautiful in a way. 
But there's a danger in that because they feel that they have the right to cover up for each other unto the very end. People might be watching this and you're, you're leveling these you know, serious accusations uh, against the diocese. And I don't take that lightly because I know some of these people. What, in your view, needs to change with the Diocese of Lafayette? What we have been saying from the very beginning is we need a third party, non-diocesan, independent investigative board. Um, it seems very straightforward. If they have nothing to hide, then it's no big deal, and it assures the public of, uh, of that, that trust and accountability. The group's demands were even met with a hellfire warning from the bishop. Yes, we're all going to hell, apparently. The statement said, you know, slander, detraction, defamation Which of we character haven't done. We are haven't morally done any sinful. Of the, uh, no, we haven't slandered. Why would they put that out there then? They're scared. They know that we have stuff and we're working and we're going to expose it for the good of the church. And people criticize us and say that, oh, you don't have the good of the church. And I know we love the church. We absolutely adore the church. We love the hierarchy. We have no intention of usurping the authority of the bishop. That's not our goal. We want to assist the bishop, encourage him to do the right thing. You know, playing devil's advocate for a moment, um, the group is calling for transparency, yet has remained anonymous yeah. until now. Yeah, two reasons why we were initially anonymous was strategic. One, we wanted the information to speak for itself. And then two, uh, there, there is a concern about retaliatory uh, actions from the diocese. Priests have come to us and said they are scared of the chancery. Has there been any retaliation? Uh, so far, no, I think. I, but, but it has been said that this diocese acts like a mafia. And I know that will freak good Catholics out. They don't want to believe that about the church. People call Lafayette the New Holy Land, but that naive opinion uh, betrays the, uh, the, the ignorance of the reality behind the scenes. Repeated requests for a one-on-one -on -one interview with Bishop Desitel have been declined or ignored. The Charter for the Protection of Children and Young People calls for the church to be open and transparent, something Bishop Desitel promised two years ago. We do have guidelines, but it's just common sense that the crisis mode are things like transparency, informing the public, having a press conference, all of those are lessons that we have learned over the years that this is, this is how this is addressed. Our request for an interview with Bishop Desitel still stands. Since we published the list, we've heard from several alleged victims telling us about their abuse and their cases that have never been reported. Our team will stay on it, investigating these as they come in. On behalf of KETC Investigates, thank you for watching The List. I'm Jim Hummel. Good night. The Pope is uh, saying that uh, they were supposed to be held accountable. I haven't seen one in Lafayette Diocese that's held accountable. And it will never stop until the laity stand up. It's real important to know that there is help out there and there is life after clergy abuse. I personally have utmost faith in Jesus Christ and his promise that the gates of hell will not prevail. I don't doubt that. We're going to come through this. My name is Lisa Strauss. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I do work with uh, some of the victims of clergy abuse. It's really important that you know that there's a lot of help out there, and there are people like me who are willing to help, and there is life after this. There really is. It's not something you will ever forget. So I don't want people to think that, you know, it's gone and la-di-da, everything's rainbows after that because that doesn't happen. But you will learn how to deal with this and you will learn how to live with it and you will feel better as a person. You will. So be brave, take a chance, and look, get some help.